my mouse is different. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our PD today about how we can support our ML students in ELA class. I'm Leslie Morris. I'm your high school ELA specialist. I'm Amy Gutierrez, and I am a middle school, high school specialist for multilingual learner supports. You do it all. Yeah. Yeah. And DLI world language. <laughs> I know. She's one busy lady. So um, this is a two-part uh, bite-sized PD. Today, we're going to focus on how we can help kids feel welcome in our classroom and how he, we can approach classroom novels. And then next month, we'll be talking about how we can scaffold our assignments for ML learners. And we have a four-step process for you. So tune in next month too. So because of that, our learning objective covers both months. So we, um, our objective is that you'll learn how to scaffold reading and writing tasks that support ML students and foster classrooms that value inclusion. So first, we want to say a big thank you because just watching the presentation and wanting to learn more about it means that you care so much about your ML students. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for being here. It's the first step, right? <laughs> okay. We're going to go over um, expectations, um, overall expectations uh, regarding requirements that we have through Title III on supporting our multilingual learners, but then also what types of expectations you can have um, with the background of your students, um, what kinds of things you can do to find out what they know yeah. and capitalize on on their um, their assets. Yeah, I know that as I've worked with students, or sorry, as I've worked with teachers, a lot of them I almost feel failure as a teacher when their MLs that are newcomers are not speaking fluently in class or are struggling with assignments. And sometimes it's not your fault as a teacher. It's just the level that the student's at right now with language. Right. right. You'll see that some pick up the social language right away and they're real talkative in class. But then when you see their work, it's not matching up to those expectations that you have. And so um, a lot of times you'll see that they get the the social language first, and it takes time for them to build that cognitive academic language proficiency. Yeah, I think I read that it can take like seven to 10 years yeah. for a student to become a fluent, like a native speaker in English with all the academic language that they need. Yes, and they can have a long, silent period. So in a nutshell, there is no one size fits all. And um, just remember that it, you know, as Leslie mentioned, it takes several years to build um, proficiency. It takes a lot of time. And some of them may go through a silent period of up to two years. So um, just remember that you have a team of support to back you up. We're here to answer any questions you may have and help you along the way. Yeah, definitely. So the next thing is, creating a sense of belonging. Will, yes. you, will you teach us about um, the six essentials for equitable learning? Because when I learned this, it was really powerful for me. Okay, so the six, essential, the six essentials are basically um, the verbs that we use as a reflective process when, um, when, uh, when we're teaching. And those, uh, those verbs are value, expect, engage, support, observe and reflect. And I've included um, a link to a webinar on the six essentials. Yeah, and this sure. is by Tanya Ward Singer. But um, something that I think stood out for us when we watched this webinar was, you know, it, it really hit home with me. And, you know, and I saw it happen a lot when I was teaching. Um, if a student doesn't feel a sense of belonging, a sense of belonging, um, anything else you try to put in to place as far as strategies and supports, they'll fail. So without value, I mean, you're not going to get very far. Yeah. So that's, a, it's so great to remember that. Yes. As you get your newcomers, 
um, you want to get a baseline. And you can expect that some of these students are experiencing text in learning for the first time. So um, they may come from, uh, they may not have had a formal education. And that's what we call students with limited or interrupted formal education or SLIFE, SLIFE students. So um, just because they are SLIFE, it doesn't mean that they can't learn. And so um, you want to start where they're at and support with the home language as much as possible. Yeah, and I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but this is why translation may not be the best option. Um, if they don't have literacy in their home language, right. then translation isn't actually a scaffold or a support. Right. We've now introduced two languages and texts that they need to try to learn. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I've included a resource on SLIFE students. Yeah, um, it's from the WIDA website. Great. Okay, under federal requirements, what we have to do is ensure all students have access to grade level content. Um, they, we want to make sure that they attain English proficiency and develop high levels of academic achievement in English, and also that they meet the same challenging state academic standards as other students um, that are not multilingual learners. Yeah. And I've included uh, fact sheets on, on that as well. Perfect, thank you. Cause I know like there are laws surrounding our ML students just like there are with SPED students. And it's important that we understand those laws. Okay. This, um, the WIDA proficiency level descriptors will tell you what you can expect for each language learner at each level of language proficiency. So every uh, February, January through February, uh, multilingual learners have to take the WIDA access assessment. Once they come to us uh, from a different district, out of state, out of the country, they take the WIDA access uh, placement. And once they once that happens, then um, they will have to take it, the WIDA access assessment um, in the spring. And so um, once we have that baseline, you, you can find out so much more about them, where they're at with each, in each domain of language, reading, speaking, listening, and writing. And these descriptors will help you um, in your planning to determine how you can move them from one level to the next in all of these areas. And you'll see that they will have really big gains to start. Mm -hmm. So once they get to like a level three, and that's why we see so many students like just level out at, mm -hmm. and, and remain stagnant at a level three, um, that is when they're starting to be to build the more technical language, mm -hmm. the more uh, difficult um, academic terms and whatnot and concepts. So um, that's where the challenge, they see the most challenge um, when they do take this assessment. So um, if you look at the can-do descriptors, this is more task oriented to let you know what they can do at each level with regarding tasks, but those descriptors will help you in moving them from one level to the next, as I mentioned before. And I included those as a resource on this, on this slide as well. Yeah, so if you have a student who has a one in their writing in on their Vita access test, it, check out those can-do descriptors because you'll want to modify the essay that you give them to meet what their level is and what they can do at that level and be successful. And so as you're looking at adjusting assignments to support your teachers, like reach out to me, reach out to Amy, like we can help you understand those proficiency levels and the can-do descriptors and how students can meet the standard as long and also be supported in what they can do and right wh where their language proficiency is at. So on that note, let's talk about whole class novels and reading. So we have best practices and some guidelines for you. 
The first thing is to provide guided notes. These are shortened notes for the day um, or for the unit the students can refer back to. They should have your learning intentions and success criteria, your important vocabulary images, and then sentence stems or starters or frames, right? Right. And we have the link for our guided notes for this presentation. So if you click on that, you'll see the scaffolding um, that we're actually gonna do next month. We decided not to cut the notes in half, um, but it's really great to like shorten the amount of text for students or yes. as you're reading a novel, as we're having discussions, providing notes to help students through those discussions about what they're reading. Right. And, you know, they can add whatever translations and things that come up um, as they're going through, you know, the lesson. Yeah, it's not an assignment, it's for them. So, okay. So another great thing to do is to use cooperative learning structures as you're reading the novel. And in ELA, we most often see these as, as literature circles. And the reason why these are really powerful powerful for MLs is it gives them a chance to listen and speak and write with their peers. And I mean, it's a low stakes setting for them. Yeah. It's not whole class. Mm -hmm. It's not in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. And as you pair and group students, they can build relationships and friendships. And I, I found in my classes, my students really wanted to be there and support the ML students. Mm -hmm. They wanted them to learn. They wanted them to be part of the class. Right. So I think we have really empathetic students. Um, it also allows time for like to model skills mm -hmm. before breaking into small groups, because often with literature circles, they're all reading different novels. So you model as a teacher the task and then they break into their groups. And modeling is a key component of supporting MLs. Yes. Something with uh, the groups is I would always make sure that they were a heterogeneous mix so that I wasn't, um, so that they didn't depend on their home language all the time because I often had students who were, um, their home language was Spanish. And so I would make sure that I mixed them up so that they could hear good examples of English. Um, and also um, that they, yeah. They get that practice. Right, they got practice. Yeah. So, so and um, then, you know, those Spanish speakers didn't feel like they overwhelmed, that they were always dependent on to carry your the newcomers. Yeah, sometimes students. we use our students who do speak the language as walking translation services. And <laughs> yes. It's, it's a burden on them, even though they will probably tell you, I guarantee you, they will tell you that it's okay and they want to help. It is, it is hard on them because they're also learning as well. Right. So it's always good to meet with them first and make sure it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then continue to follow up with them to right. make sure it's still okay. <laughs> yes. The other great thing about literature circles is that your um, ML students can read the novel in their home language because they're reading independently outside of class and they can still participate and they know what's happening in the story. I, we didn't put this in here, but often with literature circles, students can choose their books. Mm -hmm. So they can choose a book that they're interested in and that interest and that choice is really powerful yes. for supporting them. So we have here a sample lesson, um, literature circle video, and I can tell you in a few months, I'm going to be doing another bite-sized PD about literature circles and um, student choice in novels. So I'm working with the teachers at Alta for that. So, awesome. so let's talk about translation. Uh, that's always or not to translate. That's always the big question. That is the question. <laughs> so our answer to translation is yes, but so yes, you can provide translations. However, think about these things. There are some considerations before you provide one. Yes. So the first one is one we've already mentioned. The student may not be able to read at grade level in their home language. Yeah. Um, 
every time you provide a translation, you could be delaying their progress with the acquisition of English language. And I have a really great example for you. So my grandmother is from Belgium mm -hmm. and she immigrated to the United States and married my grandpa. It's like this great love story, I think, but um, she didn't speak any English. And my grandpa was a dairy farmer. They lived in a very small community. So she did not see or speak to anyone who spoke English except for at church. And my grandfather would translate for her. And at home, they spoke French. And my mother it was the oldest. And it wasn't until she went to school that my grandmother decided that she really needed to learn English. And so uh, they kind of said no French in the home. Mm -hmm. And she that's when she learned English. She Because she spoke French all the time, she never had that opportunity to practice English. And she, it was, it was a rough transition. Like it was hard for them, yeah. but she went on to get her GED and she became a nurse and went to college. That's awesome. And it all happened like after she made that conscious choice to, to struggle. So my mom remembers teaching my grandmother English and teaching her how to write words in English. Mm -hmm. So Go grandma. That was really yeah. vulnerable. That's <laughs> awesome. We made a conscious effort. Well, my dad did. My dad would speak to us in English and my mom always spoke to Spanish so that we didn't lose Spanish, but that we also, you know, would keep up on our English. So, yeah. So the third reason why we don't just give translation is that it can be confusing. Yes. When I was teaching, I would be co-teaching or supporting in a content classroom and um, there would be times where I would be asked to interpret for a student and then still trying to listen into what the teacher was saying and the student trying to listen to me and the teacher. It just, you know, after a while, they would just say, um, we prefer to listen to the English. Mm -hmm. And, and um, when they would try to translate back and forth, like say between a device or looking at a dictionary um, it just got to be overwhelming, overstimulating for them. Yeah. And they're always like steps behind mm -hmm. or worst case scenario, they start not listening to the teacher at all. Right. Right. They tune out. They tune out the teacher. Um, and the other thing is that some terminology just doesn't translate. Mm -hmm. And I think about um, academic vocabulary, we want students using our academic vocabulary. In English. In English. I mean, if we think about it, we use ethos, pathos, and logos. It's Latin, mm -hmm. but that's the terminology for that rhetoric. And so that's what we use. We don't translate that into English. Right. So, okay. Re Next, translation's yes. a scaffold. Right. You want them to use it, but make it a gradual release until they can function um, successfully on their own with English. So yeah. eventually, it's not a solution. It's a scaffold. Right. Yeah. Eventually you want to just start taking it away little by little uh, so that it, it doesn't become a crutch. Yeah. So if you're going to use translation, definitely translate descriptions or definitions. Um not just the key terms. Right. So and you mentioned that before where you want them to be using those terms in English as much as possible. Yeah. And um, one thing you can do is to create a, like a personalized dictionary in a way mm -hmm. where it has the word in English. So they have the academic language and the translation in their language. And if, if we have students who, um, we're going to talk about this next month, but you can use AI to get really good translations in languages that aren't even written in a Roman alphabet. Right. Which is great. Yes. Um, the second thing is provide translations, uh, translated summaries of length, lengthy texts. So next month we'll actually demonstrate this where I look up a chapter of what we're reading and then translate it into or copy and paste it into chat gpt and ask it to translate it yes 
And you can ask ChatGPT to um, not translate the key terms that you want to maintain in English for students to see. Yeah. So. Yeah. We worried that we didn't have enough time this month. So we'll demonstrate that next month for you. It's really cool. Yeah. And then we have here provide both copies of translation in English. And we had just said, don't give them both copies, right? Right. So clarify that for us. When do we want to give them both copies of English and their home language? So let's say you want to give them a quiz or some sort of an assessment in their home language. You want to make sure that they have the English and that they respond on the English copy and they only use this, the whatever translation in their home language as a reference as they're taking their, as they're completing their assessment. That yeah. would be one area. Um, another one that you and I had discussed was providing uh, the novel in English um, that they're reading as it, well as the translation. Yeah. So when we're in class and we're referencing page numbers or they're working in groups and they're finding quotes and doing all those things that they do with the text, we want them doing that with their English text. Right. And then they have their translated text in their home language that they can read independently. Right. And that takes us into our last point that you want to have them front load with the translation, not during instructions, because it you don't want them to miss out on that. And you can have them refer back to that translated copy during independent work time. Yeah. And so, you know, eventually you're going to have students who are who have both versions of the novel and will start choosing to use the English version. And that's a choice that they're making when they're ready. And that's kind of a signal for you that you can start releasing some, some of the scaffolds for students right? Um, because they're starting to get more comfortable working in English. Yes. Okay, great. So that's, that's the end of today. Next month, we're going to, oh no, it's not. I totally forgot we gotta... the best part. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. The last thing when you're working with novels is to chunk your instruction. Sometimes I know I did this. I wanted to read large sections of the text. Yeah. Once you get into it, you just don't want to stop. Right. right? I it. love it. <laughs> but um, that really doesn't help give space and time for our ML students to process. So will you walk us through this process of chunking instruction? Well, you want to definitely preview with something to build background for your, for your students. So maybe give some video clips, some key, um, the key, go over the key vocabulary, provide images, um, get them, hook them in, get them curious about yeah, it. Activating it, their background knowledge, yes, giving them images to associate with vocabulary. And this is, I mean, we talk about this all the time. These strategies that are good for MLs are good for all students. They're basically wiser. Yeah. Wiser strategies. Yeah. So then we're going to read a section of the text and this should be a shorter section, like right. five to 10 minutes. Yes. And you want to stop to allow them time to process that after you do read that section, mm -hmm. because um, they are on overload. Yep. So yeah, they need a lot time of to discuss it and write about it. Um, if they're not to the point where they can write a whole lot, maybe they're just writing some things in their home language or highlighting or, um, I don't know, annotating. Yeah. Or even if it's just listening, yes, listening to their, their team or their group, mm -hmm. um, as you're grouping students, make sure we talked about this, pair them heterogeneously, mm -hmm. but we really recommend if you're doing pairs and you have a newcomer to have them work in a group of three, because remember, they're probably going to be in their silent period. So yeah. they can listen mm -hmm. to the others speaking. All of them can participate, um, but it's a really low stakes group for them. Right. Because if they're in a pair, there's an expectation that they have to speak back. Right. Um, and they might not be at a place where they're speaking yet. And this is where um, they would be referring back to their handout, the guided notes that you provided for the day. Mm -hmm. And so maybe those sentence frames and word banks are already on there. That was our next point. Yeah. So, um, and sometimes all of that, I mean, you, it's not something that you would have to front load or have prepared 
before class, sometimes it's in the moment, right? Yeah. Where we're providing those frames and word banks. Maybe it's on a sticky note mm -hmm. that you're writing the word bank for the student to help them out. As your other students are working in groups, you know, you can. Yeah. And we'll talk about that next time. Them independently. Yeah. So really check out this tip sheet that Amy has linked. It's amazing. And it's from. Um, Coloring Colorado. Thank you. I never, because we don't have the accent in there because it's a website. Um, it's a great website that uh, Colorado has created that I reference all the time. It's amazing. So, okay. Now I think we're ready. Next time, we're going to give you a four-step method for scaffolding and modifying assignments um, and assessments. Thank you for joining us. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me or Amy um, anytime you have questions. Thank you. Bye. Oh, I can't click end. <laughs>